I'd like to do today is really focus in on the effects. And we, the big question is, what effects are these changes having on the soil microbial community and also the faunal communities? And the question is, why is this important? Well, if you had gone to the soil health uh, workshop yesterday, how many people were at that workshop yesterday? We spent the whole day talking about all the benefits that soil microbes have in terms of plant and soil health, things like nutrient cycling, uh, resistance to biotic and abiotic stress, uh, soil quality, nitrogen fixation, etc. So we really need to consider the effects that these shifts in pH are having on these soil microorganisms that have this beneficial capability. And we really need to consider the entire soil community. Now today I'm just going to focus on fungi and bacteria, but I want to give you a quick overview to realize that the soil is not just fungi and bacteria, but there's a whole community that we really need to look at, and, and hopefully people will look at that in the future. Of course, fungi are really important in the carbon cycle. They're the things that decompose and break things down, produce these hyphae in the soil, which bind soil particles, very important for soil aggregation. And fungi can also produce things that can be visible with the naked eye, like fruiting bodies and spores. And then we have the bacteria, single-celled prokaryotic organisms. And they're really important in the nitrogen cycle, transforming nutrients. And they're kind of the masters of breaking down just about everything in the soil that you can think about. Then we have nematodes, uh, and we also consider these in plant pathology. Nematodes are very interesting because they occupy all the trophic levels in the soil. So we have nematodes that are herbivores, ones that feed on fungi, feed on bacteria, feed on other soil invertebrates. And then, of course, the plant pathogens, which uh, we're also interested in. But then there's lots of other uh, microinvertebrates in the soil that we need to consider, paramecia, amoebae, and then the macroinvertebrates, uh, like springtails, uh, millipedes, rotifers, mites. So you, you can go through this whole thing, termites, then ants, and then, of course, earthworms, which were um, very concerned about in our particular soil. So just a brief overview to tell you that the soil community is extremely complex and consists of all these things interacting in the soil to produce the soil health and the plant health. But I'm just going to be focusing in on the fungi in the soil because we have tools that we can now use. So 15 years ago, before the development of this DNA technology, we really could not answer these questions because all we could do was isolate things from the soil and identify them, and that was uh, less than 1% of the total community. But now with the development of next generation sequencing, we can go into a soil, sequence out uh, DNA, and get tens of thousands of sequence, and then we can amplify the fungal community and the bacterial community, and from one sample, we can get thousands of DNA and then go to the database, uh, identify those. So routinely, uh, from a single soil sample, we can get over 8,000 bacterial. We call these operational taxonomic units. Some people call them species, but you can kind of consider them as being uh, distinct entities. Uh, a lot less fungi in the soil. Uh, but just to mention that it, it, a lot of the research is focused on bacteria and fungi because that's where the tools are but there really needs to be a lot more work done on the protozoa and the microfauna, which I'm not going to talk about today. So the question is, how can we study the effects of pH? One easy thing we could do is take some soil, go into the greenhouse, increase the pH with lime, decrease with sulfur, and then study the microorganisms. But this really ignores all those environmental factors and is really not a real world uh, look at it. Second thing we can do is we can, oops, we can sample liming studies. And I'll talk about two of those studies today, uh, one by the uh, Oregon State University with Christine Haggerty, and the other one will be Kurt Schroeder's. And then after the break, Kurt will talk about the agronomy of that particular um, system. The other thing we can do is it turns out in long-term direct seed, where we've been applying that uh, ammonia at the same level in the soil, we've created an acid layer down about four inches or so. And then we can use that as a, another tool to compare that acid soil layer to the rest of the uh, depth. 
And then finally, we can use the spatial variation of pH across the landscape uh, and make some inferences. In this case, uh, this is work done at the Cook Farm. Actually, both of these are in collaboration with Dave Huggins, who will also be talking uh, later this morning. So here's the uh, field plot that Christine Haggerty did uh, at Pendleton and Morrow. And she set these up about two or three years ago and applied uh, four different levels of lime uh, to the top of the surface and then worked it in. And so she did it at two locations, Pendleton with 16 inches of annual rainfall and then at Morrow with 11 inches of annual rainfall. So these were replicated plot designs. And then uh, after a year, uh, we came in and sampled those. This is uh, Chun Tao, my technician, uh, took cores in all those fields, brought them back, and then extracted the DNA and did all the community work. So again, two locations, four treatments of Lyme. Uh, and they also sampled at three depths. And this is very important because there's a very strong depth effect, zero to three, three to six, and six to nine uh, over two years. And if you look at the top layer of the soil with the highest uh, level of lime, uh, they were able to increase the pH from 4.75 up to 6.6. .6. So they did a fairly good job uh, in that upper layer. Okay, so now I'm going to show you some of the results of the community analysis that we did. And I'm going to show you a lot of these, what I call biplots, where we try to separate out the communities in two dimensions. So each one of these dots represents the entire community from one sample. So we take all those 8,000 species, uh, the diversity, the abundance, and they're all basically boiled down into this one dot. Dots that are close together have very similar communities. Dots that are far apart have very different communities. And right off the bat, you'll notice that the blue dots, which are the moral samples, separate out very nicely from the, the red dots, which are Pendleton. And we have found this consistently time and time again. One of the biggest determinations of community is location. And of course, all the things that go into location, the rainfall, the cropping system, etc. So right off the bat, you can see we separate them out by the location. Now in this one here, I've imposed the liming treatments on there as different colors. And now you can kind of see that that separation isn't as distinct. We see all these colors kind of co-mingling on top of each other. Um, so that indicates that the liming effect is not as strong as the um, location effects. So what I did here is took uh, the Pendleton location just to drill in further. And here we can see the effect of depth. So the circles are the 0 to 3 inch. The triangles are the 3 to 6 and these squares are the six to nine. So you can see strong depth effect. The community in the top layer of the soil is very different from just a few inches down below. And then if we look at the effect of lime, uh, not as distinct. We can see these colors kind of intermingling on top of each other. And then we can go even further and we can parse it out based on depth. So here's the Pendleton, zero to three, three to six, and six to nine. And at the top layer here, you can see some separation of the, the treatments here. Like it looks like the zero um, line, the red ones are up here, the purple ones are the highest level. So there's some um, uh, distinction. But then when you go down in depth, you can see everything kind of falls on top of each other. So not much of an effect there. And in fact, we can run statistics. Now this is called Permanova. And we can look at the effect of Lime, and in the zero to three inches at both locations, we have a significant effect, although the R squared is not very high. So this R squared is kind of a predictive value. Um, I would like to see that up in the 20s and 30s, but it's not bad. Other thing you'll see here is that there's a strong year effect. So the years have a big difference in our sampling. But then you can see if we go into the, oops, the three to six and the six to nine, no, no effect of the line. And that kind of makes sense because that's really where the pH transformations have happened in that upper uh, soil layer. Then we can do the same thing with fungi. Pretty similar story. Here's the Pendleton communities. Here's the Morrow communities. We can separate them out very nicely on the basis of depth. So here we can see the upper soil layer 
And in this case, the, the two lower soil layers kind of all fall on top of each other. Uh, these are the liming rates or the colors, and there's really not that much of a distinction uh, going on there. And then we can do a similar thing, parse it out by depth. In this case, you can see, in this case, I actually included the year. So you can see there's a strong year effect. So if all these circles are 2017, all the triangles are 2018, but not as strong an effect on liming. Great. So again, um, looking at the uh, fungi, oh, that's even stronger. Um, we only found a significant effect in Morrow. We didn't find a, an effect um, in Pendleton. No effect when we go down to the lower soil level. So kind of the conclusion was that liming, at least at this particular point in time, had a minor effect on communities, and we only saw it in the upper layer. Depth and location are stronger drivers. And we found that fungi overall were less affected by pH than bacteria. And this kind of fits the past literature. Another thing we thought we would do on this experiment was to specifically look at the bacteria involved in nitrification. So we can design primers that will pick up particular groups that are part of that nitrification process that Hai Ying talked about. So we can look at the, ammo oops, the ammonia oxidizing bacteria that take it from ammonia to nitrate. We have another group called the archaea, which are more primitive bacteria. And then we've got a couple of um, uh, specific groups, the nitrobacter. This does the second step, so it takes nitrate to nit nitrite to nitrate. And then we've got this other group called nitrospira, which is a group that was only discovered maybe 15 years ago. It's got its own phylum. And they've actually found some of them that are able to do both steps. So they can take ammonia to nitrite, nitrite to nitrate. So what do we find? Well, here we're seeing the liming rates. And then we have the different depths. And right off the bat here, you can see there's not really a big effect of liming treatments on the ammonia oxidizing bacteria. But there's a big effect of depth. So as we go down in the soil layer, less and less of these bacteria. So they're all in the upper uh, soil surface. Um, ammonia oxidizing archaea, kind of the opposite trend. Again, not much of a liming effect, but they seem to be present down in the lower soil levels. And then nitrobacter, this resembles a, this kind of the same trend as the ammonia oxidizing bacteria. Not much of a pH effect, but most of those are in the upper soil layer. And then finally, the nitrospira, more like the um, archaea. We find them, in this case, looks like they're most abundant in that middle layer. But there's a general trend of finding them in the deeper soil layers. So again, <coughs> conclusion, it looks like the ammonia oxidizing bacteria, the nitrobacter in the upper surface, nitrospira in the lower surface. No really strong effect of liming on these nitrifiers, except we did find a slight increase in the nitrospira in some of the liming treatments. OK, briefly talk about Kurt's research. And this was another study that was done before that. Uh, and I've, wh when did you start this, Kurt? 20 2013. 2013. So this was some of the earliest work that was done in the field looking at the effects of liming. And Kurt had three locations, Potlatch, Winchester, Pullman, uh, did it over two years. He also had rotation in his experiments, but I'm only going to be talking about the wheat rotation. And then he had two treatments, no lime and the micronized lime, uh, new cow. And in that case, he was able to increase the pH from 4.7 to 4.8, up to about 5 or 5.1. So not as much of an increase in um, pH as we found in the Pendleton. And what I did here is separate out the three treatments. And you can see they ordinate nicely with the location. So here we have the Pullman community. Um, and we've got both years on here. And those are the square dots. Here we see the potlatch community uh, with the triangles. And here we see the Winchester. So similar to our other work, each location seems to have its own uh, distinctive community. And then the only place we saw significant effects was really in Pullman in both years. 
And here we can see the new cow treatment is in the blue, the no lime treatment is in the red. Uh, we separate those out nicely. And I put these arrows on here. These are kind of some of the uh, things that correlate very highly with that ordination. So as you would expect, pH and calcium are two of the things that really predict um, those communities in, in this particular ordination. And then this is, we, we tried to then ask the question, how many bacterial groups are really affected by lining? Um, and we use a type of statistics. In Pullman, we came up with 138 of those bacterial species were affected, uh, much less in the other two locations. And this is another way of doing that. So I don't, don't expect you to read these, but these are basically bacterial species down here. Um, anything on this side of the line are increased by liming. Anything on this side of the line are decreased by liming. And the further over that they are, the bigger the difference. So this is basically a two-fold increase. So this is a log two scale. And you can see here we've got lots of things that we can say are increased by liming. Only a few that we showed were decreased uh, by liming. So, and that basically fits the idea that uh, there are a lot of bacteria in the soil that will respond uh, positively to this increase in pH. So again, liming increased the abundance of some groups, but we really only saw strong effects uh, in Pullman. Okay, the next bit of data I'm going to show you has to do with this um, acidified layer that we find in long-term no-till systems. This is done at the Cook Farm, where we uh, took five, five foot cores on this experiment. And we basically sampled a transect across the landscape of, this is about 700, 800 meters. So we tried to capture all the landscape positions in there and also replicate them at each location. So in this case, we're going down five feet. So we're not only just looking at the top layer, but we want to get an idea of what's happening at all those levels. And here's some of those cores, as you would expect, even down to five feet, lots of earthworm activity, uh, lots of roots down there. So here's a similar ordination. And in this case, you can see these are the community at the surface of the soil. Uh, and here we see that the strongest predictors are carbon and nitrogen, as you would expect on that top soil layer. That's where all the residue is. Here's the layer about 10 centimeters down, and I call this the acid soil layer. Very, very different communities. And then if we go further down into the soil, we find all these deep la deeper layers um, pretty well separate out, but they, they're kind of all very, very similar. So in this case here, well, this is in centimeters. So this is uh, 25, 50, 75, 100 centimeters down. And then if we were to look at the gradient of pH, so what we're doing here is we're going down in depth. Here's the pH. Right at the surface, we're about 5, 5.5. We get down to that acid soil layer. We've dropped below 5. And then the further we go down, the pH increases up to about 7. And carbon also shows this same gradient. So at the top of the soil surface, as you'd expect with all the residue, that's where all of our carbon is. And as we go down, down, down in depth, less carbon, less roots down there that are contributing to that carbon. And it turns out that we can pick up this acid soil layer in a lot of our different uh, types of analysis. So here, we're looking at depth as we go down. This richness is a, a, an indication of the number of species that are out there, in this case bacteria. So on the top of the soil surface, that's where we've got the most species. Go down to that acid soil layer, they really drop off, and then basically go down as we go down in depth. And we can do a similar thing with uh, ordinating the pH. So in this case, we find that the most species are present in these red dots, which are the upper soil layer, the fewest in this acidified soil layer. But then a general trend uh, go down as we uh, de uh, increase in depth. Similar thing with diversity. Uh, so this richness is the number of species. The diversity is just the mix of different things. It's a, a different measurement. And we can do a similar thing with uh, ordinating carbon. 
So ask the question, how does the, the richness and the diversity of bacterial species vary with carbon? And it's a really good, strong um, um, effect. So the more carbon as we're going in this direction, the more richness, the more bacteria. That all makes sense. But look what happens here in that acid soil layer. That's the anomaly. So we're going up and then we come to this acid soil layer and it kind of disrupts this uh, relationship the, that we see there. And then finally, a quick look at who are the ones that are affected by depth and who are the ones that are affected by soil pH. So I'm just going to show you one example of what we call a heat map. So here we see all the bacterial families that we found that were affected. Uh, and each one of these pixels represents the abundance in that particular sample. The blue colors are low abundance. The reddish colors are higher abundance. And so we're ordinating it in this case in, with increasing depth. So we can see this group of bacteria here are all in pretty high abundance at the upper soil layer. And then as we go down, less and less. So they're really not very abundant in the lower soil levels. Then we find some that are just the exact opposite. So you don't find them in the upper soil surface, but they're very, very abundant down deep. And then finally we find these groups here that really are high in this 10 centimeter acid soil layer. And, and so those are ones that are really acid adapted uh, bacteria. The other thing that's very interesting is that as you go down in depth, fewer and fewer of those bacteria have been described. So it's almost like an unknown. And this is because all the work has been done on the upper uh, soil surface, less work down in deeper depth. So I think there's a lot more uh, that we can understand about that. So again, we've kind of made this distinction. The bacteria that are on the top surface are those that are root association, associated and what we call copiotrophs. So that means they can grow very quickly on high nutrient conditions, uh, expand very rapidly, and you don't need to know these bacteria, but, but these are kind of the common players that we find again and again. As we go down deeper in the soil, we find what we call oligotrophs. These are very slow growing things that are adapted to lower nutrient fluxes, and that makes sense because there's not as much carbon down there in the deep layer. And then finally, um, in this acid soil layer, we find this uh, Corobacter group, which is actually interesting because it's in this phylum Acidobacteria, which is, as the name implies, have adapted to acid uh, conditions. What's interesting about this whole group here is we only really knew about them maybe 15 years ago. We find them everywhere in the soil, but nobody's been able to culture them out. So we just don't know what they're doing. And then in the lower surface, we've got some other new, oops, some other new groups there. Um, that uh, this is an act, uh, actinobacteria, which is also a new group. So lots of things to be discovered as we go down further. One last slide I'll show is something called networks. And this is the idea of not only seeing who's out there, but how do they relate to each other. So each dot here indicates one particular group and if they're connected by a line, a blue line, that means positive correlations. So they always found together. Um, a red line would be negative correlations. And so I, the main thing I want to show here is the complexity of the networks uh, as you go down in depth. So at the upper surface, lots of things interacting. They can be antagonistic. They can be battling each other with antibiotics. They can be mutualistic. Um, and then as you go down, networks become less and less complex, fewer things down there. And, but you can even see at this 10 centimeter, this acid soil layer, we've got a couple of, of pretty dense uh, networks. Okay, how am I doing on time here? Oh, it looks like I've got plenty of time. Um, so maybe we'll be able to, if there's not a lot of questions, uh, go to break earlier. So the last one I want to do here is um, use the spatial variation of pH across the landscape to try and look at some of these pH effects. And you probably all heard Dave Huggins talking over the last 20 years 
about the Cook LTAR, which is a tremendous resource for looking at uh, microbial communities. And the original part of that Cook farm, which was started in 1999, converted to direct seed and has been in direct seed ever since then. So the thing that I want you to notice here, so this is after 20 some years of no-till direct seeding and we look at the pH across the landscape compared to that conventionally tilled uh, field. And so the red color are the lowest pHs and then the orange are higher and then the, the yellow is higher. So right off the bat you can see that we've decreased the pH significantly in the upper soil surface in this long-term direct seed. Uh, and that's because we've been applying all that nitrogen uh, in a single band. And then as compared to the conventional treatment, the pHs are higher. But the other thing you'll notice here is there's quite a bit of variation in pH across the landscape. Of course, we already know this. So this provides a tool then if we can then um, sample the communities at these different locations at the different pHs and then try to do a correlation. Just see are there some that are affected by pH, others aren't. And so with this work we actually sampled two depths, 0 to 4 and, and 4 to 8, about 120 locations on either side, sampled the communities and then tried to do some correlations with pH. Okay, the first thing off is that really all the differences were in that upper soil layer. So as I talked about before, it's that upper soil layer that's really the, the key here. And so here's a couple of examples of bacterial groups. So what we're looking at here is increasing abundance, and this is a log 2 scale, versus the pH on the y-axis here. So we can see it appears that this group has a negative correlation, i.e. it seems to be more abundant in acid conditions. But the confounding factor here is, that is, is that an effect of pH or is that an effect of the no-till system? Because what I also did was I put all the no-till uh, dots in black, all the uh, conventional dots in yellow, and you can see that there's more of these black dots here at lower pHs than the red dots. And so it may just be a confounding effect of the no-till. And in fact, we know that this flavobacterium group really likes a lot of plant residue. So that could be kind of an anomaly. Uh, and then on the other hand, we look at our nitrospira. This has a positive correlation. In other words, it likes, it's more abundant under alkaline condition. So you can see here as the pH increases, our abundance increases. And in this case, the red and the black dots pretty well mix up together, so I don't think that's a tillage effect. And this actually fits the results. If you remember back when I was talking about the qPCR results with the nitrospira and, and others, the fact that we tend to find this in the lower depths where the pH uh, is higher. And then a few more examples of uh, that. This one here is looking at families, and we take it down to a uh, higher resolution and look at some species. And here we can see two good examples of actinobacteria positively correlated with pH. So as the pH goes up, we increase in abundance. And this group here is that actinobacteria that we typically find mainly in the lower soil profiles where the pH is, in fact, uh, a lot higher than the upper surface. And then a few examples of some negative correlations. Uh, here we see one, this calobacteria group. Don't really know much about that. Um, so it, it may be more abundant in acid conditions. And then here's another example. So we can now start to go through and pull out some of these uh, potential groups and say, yeah, these are the, the, the main players that may be involved in being affected by soil pH. And then the final thing we did was this model. And we wanted to ask the question, which species are the most predictive in terms of response to pH? So in a lot of cases, it's not the whole 8,000, but you can pull out some key species that really appear to be uh, affected by pH. 
And in fact, with this model, we explain 50% of the variance, and that's really pretty high with models. And so what we're looking at here are all, a bunch of different bacterial species. Uh, the further they are to the right, the more the variance they explain. And I put the red ones that have negative correlations and the blue ones as positive correlations. And what's quite interesting is a lot of the most predictive ones, I don't know if you can read this, but these GP1, 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 these are all acidobacteria, 7, 3, 1. So they appear to be the most responsive, but what the most puzzling thing is the relationship go both ways. So some are negatively correlated, some are positively correlated. So I'm not really sure uh, what to make of that totally. So just a few conclusions. Um, the number of bacterial families and, and, op, uh, and, and species are correlated with pH. Uh, we think it could be confounded by tillage. And then this group called acidobacteria explains most of that variation uh, in that model, but, but the correlations go both ways. So finally, a few take home messages. So I'm going to try and boil this down in about two or three slides. A lot of research there, uh, and we've really only be begun to scratch the surface. But one overall conclusion I've had is that the bacterial and fungal communities appear to be fairly resilient to large changes in pH, at least based on the liming experiments. But I have to put a caveat there, and that is, this is these are short-term experiments. Okay, so we're only looking like one year out, two years out. You know, what's going to happen ten years out? You know, my prediction is that those communities will shift a lot more the longer we apply that. And in fact, we've got some pretty good evidence of that. There's a long-term study that we're working at with uh, Kate Reardon in, in Oregon, where they've had these long-term plots out there since 1931. And they've got different treatments like manure and conventional fertilizer. And there we can pick up huge shifts. And at the same time, huge changes in pH. So their manure treatments, very high pH. Their conventional treatments, pretty low pH. So I think that if I had to take a guess, I would say that uh, we're looking at a very early stage here. So we may um, have bigger shifts. Second thing is that all these changes we're seeing are in the upper soil layer. And that's because that's where we've shifted the pH. Okay, we're incorporating these at a fairly shallow depth. It might take years to find pH shifts that we go down further. So that's my other uh, caveat there. But be that as it may, we've certainly been able to identify bacterial groups that are sensitive to pH changes. Um, you know, pH is a major driver in the soil environment, so we would expect that. And then the other thing is that depth and tillage system are going to be confounding factors that are going to make it difficult to uh, sort out these uh, different effects. So with that, uh, I'll open it up to questions. And it looks like I may have finished up quite a bit early, but that's okay. Yeah. Yeah, so his question was, do we have any information on the functional uh, abilities of these uh, bacteria? And that's a good question. That's kind of the next holy grail, because with these techniques, all we're able to say is who it is. Now, we can make some inferences if people have sequenced those genomes, and therefore we have all the genes, and we can say, oh, it's got this biochemical ability, this biochemical ability. But to get to that level, we would have to go to something called transcriptomics, where you actually isolate the RNA that's being transcribed to form those genes and then make inferences. Uh, the other thing you can do is, like we did with the qPCR, we can target a specific biochemical pathway and just look at that gene. So that's what we did with those four uh, major groups. But yeah, the question is functionality. Um, and I would say that's a big unknown. On a per magnetic. Yeah. Uh, just a, uh, can, do we have another microphone we can kind of pass around, or is that, you know, because I, I want people to kind of hear what you're saying. Um, on, the, uh, on the specifics of what you may know for the, the uh, uh, characteristics of the various bacteria, mm -hmm. some of the research that we've been doing uh, shows 
the uh, interaction that some of these require some type of a contact with a pathogenic bacteria as well as a, a pro uh, bacteria. And then uh, some of those interactions create different compounds that nourish or uh, provide nutrients for other bacteria as they're driven through a, uh, a motion, the natural motion of uh, water purification. So as the water dries down at a certain temperature, it'll cause a uh, pumping action to uh, draw up additional bacteria into the field where the roots are available. Yeah, no, we haven't done any work on that. The other thing that I will mention is that the problem with all this work is you're just looking at correlations out there. And to, to establish causality, we need to hypothesize a bacterium, isolate it, get it in the culture, and then do experiments in the greenhouse to say, yes, this is protecting the plant, this is giving drought resistance, etc. But the problem is, as I mentioned before, when we try to isolate bacteria, we're only isolating uh, you know, the, the, a few of the ones that grow easily on our media. And all those things down deeper in the soil, all those uh, oligotrophs, they're hard to get. But I think somebody has to make a concerted effort. I think that's where the next stage with this research needs to go. Well, the reason for the question about the isolation on different bacteria is because we've seen it in a collective uh, state and the indicator for us is the uh, nutrient density of the tissues and the uh, developments of the root systems. So those are the indicators that we've seen when we incorporate the, uh, the positive effects. So if we could come up with something else, or like I said, we may later when we talk about the yeah. resources availability. Okay. Other? Yeah, in the back there. Uh, you mentioned the uh, actino bacteria or actinobacters yep. being some of the species where it seemed to be mostly infected. Uh, yeah. Or yeah, acid acidobacteria. Yes. Yeah. What other can you explain the role or what these what we know so far about these? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, you know, once they started sequencing DNA all over the world, even though they were first discovered under extreme acid conditions and mine spoils, that's where they got the name, um, we find them all over the place. They're a huge component of soils all over the world, but there's only like been one or two that have been cultured out. It's like a big unknown. Um, you know, and, and again, I think maybe people can try to use something called metagenomics, though, even though you can't culture it out, um, can you then extract DNA and reconstruct the genome from what's in the soil? And that's much more difficult to do. And so I, I'll have to admit I'm not familiar with that literature where their people have started to assign metabolic things. But the ones that they did culture out, they only cultured them under very high CO2 conditions, and they're extremely slow. That's the key with all these is it may take, you know, one or two months to see something in culture and, and you know, we, we can't put a graduate student on that kind of research, they would never finish up. I'm uh, just trying to grasp what I can from everything. I was under the impression on the Cook Farm, mm -hmm. the southeast field, which was no-till, you said the pH was lower, mm -hmm. so it was more acidic, and it was the no-till. Right, in the upper layer. Okay, I thought that no-till was being uh, put forward as the new way to go because it was good for that, for the acidity, but what am I missing? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's a, uh, it's a double-edged sword because I think on, on the one hand, you're producing a lot of residue in the surface, a lot of organic matter, which as Haying just talked about, are things that will certainly improve the, the pH condition. So what I think is happening is that with that direct seed system where we're banding all the ammonia down into this layer and not mixing it as in conventional, so what we're finding is we're, you know, concentrating it down there. So the question, and we'll hear lots of talks later on, how do we manage that um, through, you know, whatever technique. So, um, so that's a particular uh, Thing. And I think 
other people have documented that in direct seed system. The other question is how long will that remain there? Will you get a, a buffering capacity over time? So, yeah, and I think some other uh, speakers can address that in more of the management uh, thing. I just wanted to add a little bit um, to answer your question. So, the again, the reason that in no till, they, they got it. The soil get acidified faster is because we uh, in no-till system we apply nitrogen in high rate uh, in a band. So when the little soil volume is taking so much nitrogen, um, and during these nitrogen transformations, all kind of processes that are uh, happening in that specific layer. And that specific layer get acidified very, very quickly. And then uh, as the soil pH in that layer gets lower, and that acidified layer moves down and down and down when time um, moves. But at this point, um, a lot of soils in Lotio soils, soils in Washington State, uh, majority of acidified layer is still in um, the layer where the fertilizers are repeatedly applied. While in, in conventional till system, you till the soil at least a six inch depth, right? And then uh, you are mixing up the big volume of soil. And although you are applying, this, even if you are applying the same amount of fertilizers, but the volume of the soil that is dealing with it is much bigger. So it doesn't mean that conventional practices does not acidify soil, it does, it's just a lot more slower. When you apply the fertilizer, doesn't that, don't you have a pH shift or the pH uh, uh, actually in increases in that layer when you're actually applying it? And then, uh, then when does it? Yeah, I'll, I'll let Haig, so the ammonia, yeah, ammonia itself will bring the pH up. Oh, when you apply the fertilizer, don't you have a pH shift where it actually increases the pH when you're applying it in that zone? And then when does it then start dropping down? That's a good question. So it really depends on what fertilizers you're applying. So if you are applying urea, so during the hydrolysis, if you remember uh, the slide that I showed you, during the hydrolysis, the uh, hydrogen is, um, so the uh, hydroxide is released. Actually, that um, process tempor temporarily increases pH. It can increase pH actually quite a amount. Um, that's, that's the, so that's one of the things that why around the urea uh, uh, pot and pellet around it, um, you have ammonium uh, volatilization. That's because temporary pH can increase dramatically. And so when the pH is higher than 7.7, .7, then all of a sudden your ammonium can release to the air a lot. So that's urea. But um, if you are saying ammonium directly goes to uh, reducing your, your pH. So it does not have this temporary uh, increase effect of pH. So in recognizing that using the no-till system has a greater impact on the upper four inches um, with the application of fertilizer, are there any research studies, you know, and this probably speaks a little bit to some of the conversations that were had yesterday about other methods of trying to have fertilization with diversity of crops. Are there any research plots that are doing long-term studies looking at non-application of fertilizer and using things like legumes, lentils, those types of things, and seeing if that has an effect overall of not only reducing the continued drop in pH, but maybe helping to amend it in fields that have had that done to them for a long time. Yeah, that's a good that question. That would be a really good thing to do. <laughs> Anyone can try to find it? Uh, Dave, back there, I see Dave Huggins raising his hand. Uh, yeah, I don't know if Dave wants to take a crack at that. Well, that's a great question. And, uh, um, you know, 
Now we do have some studies that pertain to that. Um, one is just uh, putting ground back into CRP, so the Country Rights New Reserve Program. We've followed, um, you know, a history of just putting in you know, either native species or perennial species, and you'll see a rebound of the pH over time near that surface. It's it's not very quick. It's about a half a unit every ten years. <laughs> so from that standpoint, there is this kind of um, adjustments that can take place, and some of that is pumping bases from the subsoil back into the surface foliage. You're not removing anything, of course, and you're returning back to the surface, and so that's kind of a natural way that uh, bases get cycled and the pH can be impacted. But that, that Alex over here is also uh, uh, looking at organic systems and and other kinds of, of uh, soil health uh, issues, and pH being one of those. And you're right that uh, we don't escape acidification, but legumes, because they also, uh, through the nitrification process, uh, create hydrogen ions that go out into the soil as well. So, but it's it's less than what we do in terms of synthetic fertilizer.